In today's podcast, we will discuss why Lewis Hamilton was lucky to win in Brazil, why Ferrari's tyre gamble did not pay off, and look at the Max Verstappen Esteban Ocon incident, and also, of course, how the midfield did in Sao Paulo. So here we are guys for another episode of the podcast, this time reviewing the 2018 Brazilian Grand Prix and as ever I'm here with Niblo, how are you doing mate? I'm doing fantastically well, how are you? All good after a fantastic Brazilian Grand Prix and I have to say, I still just, I can't believe how great the race was but we'll get onto that later. First off let's go on to Mercedes of course, the Constructors Champions now. Pace-wise in the race, they didn't have the fastest car. Out of the top three teams, I think they were the slowest. Uh, And I think Lewis Hamilton was definitely a lucky boy this weekend. Getting the pole position when I think he should have been given a penalty for the whole Sorokin stuff. And then, you know, with Max Verstappen being took out, as we'll get onto in a minute. Lewis was definitely lucky, for sure. I don't think we can really doubt that. For Valtteri Bottas... Really poor pace, really poor, struggled on the tyres, especially the rear tyres, and had a poor Grand Prix nib. What did you think of Mercedes uh, and their pace, and what did you think of Lewis Hamilton? Do you think he was, you know, very lucky to get pole position and the race win? Well, he was certainly lucky to get pole, Uh I still don't know how he hasn't got a penalty. I know Charlie White has come out and said that they didn't give him a penalty because both of them were on outlaps. But for me, it was still very dangerous and doesn't matter if they're on outlaps. Um, and he was even luckier in the race as the news has come out after the race that Lewis had a major power unit issue and the exhaust was just about to fail with all the temperatures going over what it should over what they should be and he just stuck ahead of Verstappen to win of course we'll talk about Verstappen later but yeah Hamilton was certainly a lucky boy this weekend very lucky but he manages to get the win as he always does somehow he did he did well he was certainly a lot quicker than Valtteri Bottas this weekend Bottas was very very poor especially in the race and you mentioned how he was struggling on his tyres. Obviously, he had to pit again after Ricardo got past him. I must say, after the Japanese um, race, the Japan race, the, Lewis and Bottas were talking in the, like the debrief room, and Hamilton said, "Oh, my tyres only got up to a hundred and like thirty or something degrees," and Bottas was like, "Oh, mine were a hundred and thirty-eight or something like that." I know someone can go find the footage from that, but that was very interesting to me to see how poor Bottas is of managing his rear tyres. So that certainly played a factor, and that is certainly something that Valtteri Bottas has to improve up. Certainly for Bottas, yes, I do agree. He does have to improve that. I remember a race early on in his uh, Mercedes career, I think Bahrain in 2017, where he got his first pole. He was holding up, I think, a five or six or even seven car train because he was struggling on his rear tyres. So this is something Valtteri, I think, has struggled with quite a lot ever since he joined uh, the Silver Arrows. But there you go. It looks as though Valtteri does need to learn how to look after his tyres. But next up, we'll go on to Ferrari. Now, I have to say, coming into this weekend, I think, Nib, you thought this as well, Ferrari had no real excuse to not be, you know, right up there for the race win here in Brazil because the first and third sectors are all about power and they have the fastest car in a straight line. So, Surely, Ferrari would be very quick here in Brazil. And of course, they did have a good enough car in the middle sector. But when it came to qualifying, I think Vettel just didn't produce enough to get pole. And of course, their tyre gamble on the soft tyres, starting on the soft tyres, did not work. And yeah, I have to say again, Ferrari were just disappointing. And Nib, for Ferrari... I have to say with this race, I don't know what you think, but to me, this race weekend just proves why Ferrari 
have not won either the driver's title of Sebastian Vettel or the constructors because when it comes to when it matters in qualifying or when it matters in the race, they just don't produce the goods. Yeah, at times this season they have produced the goods, but not enough. Like Lewis Hamilton always produces the goods. Vettel and Raikkonen haven't been good enough at stages of this season to beat Mercedes in both championships. But Kimi Raikkonen during the race was absolutely fantastic. He was very, very quick, especially compared to Sebastian Vettel, who had some sort of sensor issue, which you touched on in your race review. So that hampered his pace. And of course, he was struggling on the tyres. Starting on the soft tyres was definitely, definitely the wrong decision. And yeah, they they were lucky to get a podium with Raikkonen. If Ricardo had one or two more laps, he would have got past Raikkonen. So it was, it was quite a disappointing weekend for for Ferrari. But I also want to bring up one fact that's going to shock a lot of people. Kimi Raikkonen has 12 podiums this season, but Sebastian Vettel only has 11. And Kimi Raikkonen has retired from three races. Sebastian Vettel has retired from one race, which obviously changed the championship. That's quite an interesting and fascinating statistic that Raikkonen has been the far more consistent driver this weekend. Oh, sorry, not this weekend, but over the whole majority of the year. And he's only 51 points, I believe, off Vettel in the championship. So it would have been quite interesting to see where Raikkonen was or is without having those extra retirements. So very, very harsh on Kimi being booted from Ferrari, that's for sure. Right, now we'll go on to Red Bull. Of course, there is lots to talk about with Red Bull. And because... I have talked plenty about Max Verstappen and the whole, you know, Esteban Ocon incident. And yeah, it just feels like I'm repeating myself. And because I'm making a video on that situation on Thursday, where I will go a lot deeper into this situation, I'm going to leave it to Nib as to, you know, his thoughts and his opinion. So Nib, was Ocon at uh, at fault for you or was Verstappen at fault for turning in and what did you think of what happened after with the whole pushing and you know uh, some of the stuff that Max said well there is absolutely no doubt in my mind that Esteban Ocon was 100% at fault for this incident he came out the pits was behind Verstappen for two laps I believe on super soft tyres there's been a little bit of footage that's come out that I've seen on Twitter where Ocon is not getting held up by Verstappen as he was claiming at all in the last sector. And then on the straight, about halfway down the straight, if you watch the footage, he deploys like nearly all of his ERS power and absolutely kills Verstappen in the straight line and then goes for the move. So... Ocon claiming that he was faster than Verstappen is absolute nonsense. The only reason why he was quicker than Verstappen was because he had a Mercedes engine and he was using all of his ERS. It was a ridiculous, ridiculous decision to go for that move on Verstappen, who was in the lead. I nearly got taken out in the lead a few weeks ago, and I, if, I, if that had happened, I would have punched a hole in the wall. So I can certainly, certainly understand Max's reaction to to what Ocon did, it's a very often occurrence, a very regular occurrence in V8 supercars, which is the Australian like top category, for drivers to go after the race if they have a crash, to go give a bit of push and shove. They shouldn't have done it. Max shouldn't have done this. It was very silly for him to do it. It reminded me a lot of Michael Schumacher, that's for sure. Um, but... Verstappen was robbed of, of a race when he was absolutely fantastic this weekend. The way that he cut through both Ferraris at the start, it was absolutely incredible. It's like he, it was like dirty air was off for him. Through the middle sector, he was still quicker than everyone else. Even when they were behind, when, when he was behind the other car in front, he, it was like, I don't know. I, it was incredible to watch. 
especially when he caught up to Hamilton in the middle sector and then overtook him on the straight. It was it was in, it was incredible to see. He he probably his best drive of his career for me in the dry in the dry. I'll make that clear in the dry, and he one hundred percent should have won the race this weekend. And also, of course, you are a big follower of Daniel Ricciardo. What did you think of his race? Of course, starting in P11, coming up to P4. I think he did deserve a podium for sure. If he started in P6 where he qualified, he could have won the Grand Prix. What did you think of his race? Yeah, Dan had a very good race. Once again, it was only a couple of thousands off Max in qualifying. Finally finding his mojo back in qualifying and in the race. He's got his pace back the last few races, which is good to see. And yeah, if the mechanics didn't didn't spray the um, the fire extinguishers up the exhaust and he started P6, I think there's no doubt that he would have got a podium. He, he might have inherited the lead when Verstappen and Ocon crashed, but that's just, just a maybe, you know, we don't know for sure. But he was very quick this weekend in the race. He was fantastic. So pulled off some great moves on Vettel and Bottas and ultimately should have finished ahead of Raikkonen. In, in the end, he just ran out of laps and... It was a very positive weekend for Dan, and we'll see what he can do in Abu Dhabi. Historically, not very good at Abu Dhabi, but we will see what he can do there. Right now, let's go on to the midfield and first off McLaren. And, well, because they're so slow and now basically irrelevant, there's nothing really to talk about, is there, Nib? Yeah, you're definitely not wrong with that one. But big up Stoffel van Dorn once again, finishing ahead of Fernando this weekend, obviously Mexico. Alonso retired, but there was some good side-by-side battling between the McLarens, so we've seen them a few times, but yeah, big up Van Dorn. Now we'll go on to Renault, who did have, even though you know they didn't finish in the points and they weren't expected to and didn't have that great of a weekend, they did have quite an interesting race. So, you know, first off at the start, the two Renaults actually made a good start, but then the two Renaults made contact going into Jun Sao and going up into the start-finish straight. Now, for me, uh, Carlos Sainz was a bit too aggressive. I understand he wants to keep his teammate behind and, you know, they're racing hard, but it was early on. There was still plenty of laps to go for Sainz to get past Hulkenberg, and eventually, you know, he did finish ahead of him because of uh, Nico's reliability issue. But, yeah, definitely a bit too aggressive. Hulkenberg then had a reliability issue, I believe, to do with the power unit. Carlos Sainz did, I guess, okay to get up to P12. But for Renault, again, not that great of a Grand Prix at a power circuit. Nib, what did you think of the battling between Sainz and Hulkenberg? It it reminded me of when Perez nearly, well, just swerved straight into uh, Sorotkin at Singapore. I don't, I'm not too sure what Sainz was thinking and was very lucky not to cause a major incident with that. But, yeah, quite a anonymous race for Renault. They were nowhere in qualifying. Did well to get up the grid in the race, but very little to talk about with Renault from yesterday's race, that is for sure. Now we'll go on to Force India now. We're not going to talk about Esteban Ocon because I think we've said enough uh, in this podcast so far. We'll go on to Sergio Perez, who I thought was okay, nothing special. Got into P10. Because the Force India normally on race day does have good enough race pace, I kind of would have expected that, you know, if one of the cars who qualified in the top 10 dropped out, just like, you know, Marcus Ericsson. So, an okay race for Perez, but I have to say, you know, normally, in my books, Force India do have a good record here at Brazil. But this weekend, they they have just looked consistently, at best, sixth fastest behind Sauber and Haas. And I did not see that, because again, I thought Force India... And a track like this would be very good. Nib, what did you think pace-wise uh, of Force India? Yeah, a disappointing weekend for Force India. Usually that they are either fourth or fifth fastest in the midfield. 
They certainly didn't look like that this week. And Perez did well to get a point in the end. And I just will say one thing about Ocon. He certainly had his two worst races in his F1 career, two race weekends in a row, and very disappointing for him. Not too much to talk about with Force India, because, well, they were just really anonymous, like Renault were this race. They weren't, they were in no man's land, really. They weren't close to Haas, and they weren't close to to Hartley and Science in the end. So, yeah, not too much to talk about with them. Right, next up is Williams, and they had, well, just a, a nothing type race. They were at the back. I think they were faster than McLaren, but again, as I've said plenty of times in 2018, nowhere near where they should be. So we'll go on to Toro Rosso, who I think pace wise, they did have good pace, but I think just when it mattered around the pit stops, you know, with Pierre Gasly, who was in the top 10, they just didn't, I don't know, have enough pace or they didn't do that great of a pit stop. But with Gasly at that time, you know, just didn't have the pace at that time. But then there was controversy between Pierre Gasly and Brendan Hartley at the end of the race, which has not really been talked about um, at all. So Pierre Gasly was in P11 at the end of the race. Hartley was right behind in 12th on super soft tyres, fresh super soft tyres when Gasly was on old mediums and Sainz was 13th right behind Hartley trying to go for the move. I believe also on super soft tyres and Toro Rosso wanted uh, Gasly to move over for Hartley but he didn't do so until the, well, I guess almost the last opportunity to do so and for me, Gasly... Definitely a naughty boy in what he did there because he almost, even though Hartley did finish in P11 and they were probably only going to finish in P11 at best, he almost did let, you know, the Renault of Carlos Sainz take that position. So I have to say not good team play there. And, well, that could be a sign of things to come in 2019 with Max Verstappen. We'll have to see. But, Nib, what did you think of that whole incident yeah i thought gasly was quite um silly not to let hartley through when when you're on different strategies like that you should just be letting your team right through it's quite childish by him i think it went on for seven laps i read um on an article so that was quite ridiculous and then he only let hartley through with two laps to go i'm not too sure if that is 100 percent correct i'm sure Someone in the comments will let us know, but quite poor that by Pierre Gasly. And a, another great race by Brendan Hartley. He started in, where did he start? He started 17th and in the end went up to P11. So a very good performance by Hartley once again. And hopefully he can do something at Abu Dhabi to prove that he deserves that seat for next season. Next up is Haas, who in terms of you know, overtaking, they weren't really that exciting in the race, they finished in P8 and P9, which is a good result, but they didn't really have to do any serious battling, you know, Magnussen did, I think, lose a piece of his barge board um, at the start of Marcus Ericsson, but not the greatest race in terms of entertainment from Haas, of course, we know that these two can have plenty of accidents, and thankfully for Haas, they didn't this time, but yeah, Nib, they, they weren't really that exciting, but I guess it doesn't really matter as they picked up, as a team, six points. Yeah, didn't see too much of Haas on the telly, but good result once again for them. Where they should have been the last few races after, after what has been a very disappointing last couple of races, which has ruled them out pretty much getting fourth in the Constructors' Championship. Solid result. For Haas and a good way to bounce back after their recent struggles. And finally is Sauber, who were the best of the rest this weekend. I didn't think that coming into qualifying, I thought it was Haas, but it actually turned out to be Sauber, who Marcus Ericsson, I have to just say, fantastic qualifying performance. Qualifying ahead of Charles Leclerc, that is very impressive, and having his best qualifying of his entire career, qualifying in seventh and starting in sixth. A great weekend, even though the race, you know, was 
just a calamity. I have to say a very, very good weekend for Marcus Ericsson. But for Charles Leclerc, again, showing why he's at Ferrari for 2019 and why Nib, he really could, if the Ferrari is good next year, he could win the championship. I, I must say, I feel so, so bad for Marcus Ericsson during the race. He had an he had a Mark Webber start, was got overtaken by uh, Magnussen and Leclerc at the start, and then lost so much downforce with the contact that he had with Magnussen that, as someone on Twitter said, he had less downforce on his car than a shopping trolley. So it was no surprise that he kept spinning out. I felt awful for him. He had a great, great qualifying, out-qualifying Leclerc, as you mentioned. He deserved it, some points this weekend with um, probably one of his last, well, definitely one of his last opportunities to score points before he goes off to IndyCar next season. And, yeah, we'll move on to Leclerc now. Leclerc was so good during the race, especially the first stint. He was only a couple of seconds behind Ricardo and the Ferraris and Mercedes, the majority of the first stint. So very, very impressive by Charles Leclerc. He only dropped, he dropped away in the second stint, that's for sure, but there's not much you can do about that when you're in the Sauber. And once again, full, full credit has to go to Sauber here. This time last year, they were at, the bottom of the of the pack by an absolute mile, and twelve months on, they're at the top of the midfield. You know, it's it's a great story, and they definitely deserve all of the success that they had been getting. Before we go on to the podcast questions at the end, we are now first going to rate the race in terms of how good we thought it was. Now, this might be, um, I don't know, maybe controversial. I don't know, nor do I really care. In my opinion, this race was a 9 out of 10 because there was constant battling in, you know, the top, not only the top 6, but the top 10. It was moving around a lot. The cars were never far apart. Again, they were very close. There was always, even when, you know, some cars had pitted and some uh, cars had not, they were still having to push very hard and were very close in terms of time. So we're still competing very hard. And I don't know, that race, it just felt like kind of a race you've got back in, say, 2003 or 2004, where the drivers, yes, they were managing their tyres, but it felt like they were pushing a lot more than they were at, you know, at, say, certain other races. It felt like they were pushing every single lap and I just love the battling you know the Red Bulls Ferrari you know Mercedes Bottas everything so I'm gonna go for a 9 out of 10 nib um do you think the same um no I don't actually I I don't think this race was as good as what you're saying obviously you don't care about that but um I think I'll give it a 7 7.5 out of 10 It, it was a very good race there's no doubt about that it was one of the best races of the season, but I don't know. It still still missed a little bit of something for me there. Maybe a proper battle for the front, you know. Max just kind of flew past Hamilton, and then Max, obviously, with Ocon, then Hamilton got back through. I would have liked to see a bit more of a battle at the front to give it a, a nine sort of rating. That, that, for me, classifies as a nine. There's got to be a huge, huge battle at the front to give that high of a rating for me. Right, guys, let's move on to the podcast questions. And the only one is from Ben McCarthy, and it is a very good one. And he, uh, well, it, there's a lot in it, so let me now read through it. He says that Lewis Hamilton can breach the 400-point barrier mark in Abu Dhabi, which has never been accomplished in F1. That is true. Uh, before that is if he finishes second and stands 81 points clear of Vettel uh, throughout the season, has primarily had the quicker car in 2018. So, where does this season for Hamilton rank amongst the best single season set uh, by an F1 driver 
in their careers. And he also mentions other examples. So Jim Clark in 62 and 65, Schumacher in 2002 and 2004, Vettel in 2013, and also uh, says Fangio and Ascari. I'll also say Nigel Mansell in 1992. That's one to also uh, factor in, even though his car, I think, in terms of raw pace, I think the 92 Williams was probably the fastest or one of the fastest cars in the history of the sport. Uh, it was ridiculously overpowered compared to its competitors, but uh, there you go. Um, compared to, again, to Mansell, Vettel, Schumacher, Clark, I would say Lewis Hamilton has had the best single season of all of them because, you know, look at Clark, Schumacher, Vettel, Mansell. Vettel, for most of 2013, uh, had the faster car. Schumacher had the best car in 2002 and 2004. The same for Clark in 62 and 65. And for Mansell, well, if anyone beat Mansell in, in that season, then Mansell would have been very poor during... Uh, that season so I'd have to say Lewis Hamilton because for at least I would say I don't know 65% or 70% of the season Lewis has not had the fastest car there has been races like Australia uh, Spain uh, Austria France uh, you know Singapore Suzuka Russia races like that where Mercedes have had the fastest car but all the others I don't think they have. So, for me, it would have to be Lewis Hamilton. If he had a dominant car and did this, I would not rank it, you know, very highly. But again, because he hasn't always had the best car, I would have to say Lewis Hamilton. Right, so guys, that is it for this podcast. Thank you very much for watching and interacting in the comments as always. And thanks to Nib for uh, helping out in the comments as a moderator and for being on the podcast. Thanks, mate. And as always, as always, it's a pleasure. But anyway, guys, that's has been it for this video. Don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe for more content like this. Don't forget, guys, I'll be back on Thursday with a video on the Max Verstappen Esteban Ocon situation. And as well, don't forget to join our Discord link below in the description, also with my Twitter and my website. Comment down below what you thought of this video and comment down below what did you think of our opinions on the race. Please comment down below what you think about those topics and until next time it's been me Chazzer HD, goodbye.